Hey, what's going on, Richmond? What's going on, man? Uh, you guys are looking good. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, two years ago, two years ago, you launched out and what God was calling us to do to plant this campus here, and God is doing some amazing things. I'm so excited uh, to be here. Emmanuel, we are one church in three locations, so I want to get a shout out to Corbin and Williamsburg, and uh, we love you guys, and man, just know that God is at work here in the Richmond campus. Past two years have been amazing. Uh, I, I just uh, think the worship team, didn't they do a good job? Let's give them a hand. Man, they did good. Uh, worshiping the Lord and uh, I just last week, uh, Pastor John sent a message uh, that he had led a guy to Christ. And Griffin, I got to meet Griffin this morning. And, 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 and man, you guys don't waste any time here at the Richmond campus putting them into work. Because I, I get here, I pull in at about 9 o'clock, and I meet Griffin. He's out putting the banners up outside. I was like, he's been saved a week and a half. And, and, uh, but, man, I can't wait to see all that God's going to do in and through you because you launched this during COVID-19. I'm in a worldwide pandemic and man, just stories of life change and people coming to faith. Um, three years ago, uh, I was at Popolino's and I was having lunch with Pastor John as before he agreed to come on our team. And we were talking about the potential of launching a church here in Richmond. And, and I'll never forget John, after he swallowed down about five pieces of pizza, asked, he said, now why me? Why me? And I said, well, John, everybody I talk to that's been to Richmond that I know would always bring up this John Barron guy. John and Elena Barron. Talk to a pastor in Lexington, Ron Edmondson. Oh, John and Elena, they're amazing. God is using them in such an incredible way. I talked to some of our owners at the Corbin campus, David and Laura Smith, who are now married. He discipled them, and he married them. I was like, I, I didn't, how do you even know John? You know? and, and then Beth Foley, who is our, uh, our worship leader at the Corbin campus, uh, Brent, it's his wife. Well, she was discipled by John and Elena while they were here. And I was like, man, this John guy's everywhere. I said, John, we believe God's calling you to launch out this church because God uses you to change lives, to disciple people. And that's what we want to see. We want to see people that are far from God come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and then show up at 30 on Sunday morning. Banners. The, the, the people that are so dedicated to Lord, do whatever it takes to reach those that are far from God with the glorious God that their lives might be forever changed. And, and then I think Micah, Micah's doing an incredible job. I met Micah actually through his dad. I was preaching at an event in Lexington. It was a statewide event for pastors called Shepherding the Shepherd. And the pastors and their wives were there. And I was preaching, and Micah's dad came up to me. I didn't know him or his dad at the time. And he said, my son is going to be a freshman at the University of Cumberland's. And we, would you reach out to Micah? I said, I'd love to. We just launched the campus in Williamsburg. And so I, I texted Micah, hey, you want to get together? And we got together, and he brought his roommate. And then we met several times his freshman year or sophomore year. He would always bring his roommate with him. And, and then Micah just grew in his faith and leading life groups. And, and then he married Haley. So he was anointed king by marriage. Can I get an amen? Hey, listen, you might be in Williamsburg, Corbin, or here at the Richmond camp. You're wondering, man, I want to be on staff. Here at Emmanuel one day, well, if you're, you're a guy, you got to marry over your head, okay? Because that's what, that's what all of us did, in, including Micah. And God's just done a, a great job through him and Haley, and, and God's just using them in a remarkable way. And I think of Nick and Libby Parker, who moved from Lexington to Richmond to help launch this campus. Uh, I think of Kendall and Peyton, uh, who gra also UC graduates, came up through the ministry of Emmanuel. And then decided to move with this launch. In fact, I think we have some pictures of them and uh, their newborn. Uh, man, how awesome is that and how God's using them. They moved up here and they graduated. And we said, hey, why don't you go out and plant a church with us in Richmond? They've got to find jobs anyway. So they moved here and found jobs just to be a part of this. To, to be a part of meeting people like Tex and Eli and, 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 and Griffin coming to faith. And so many others have been touched by the gospel because of your faithfulness. Your faithfulness to do whatever it takes for the glory of God. The people that are far from God might come to know him and be transformed by his power. 
And man, I, I could mention so many more uh, that are here today, uh, but I've got to keep moving. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 14, beginning in verse 2. We're going to be in the Old Testament. As a church, we've been reading through the Old Testament. And, uh, man, it's been amazing. We've been learning from the kings. And, man, you can learn a lot from the kings of Israel and Judah. You can learn a lot what not to do. All right? First of all, King Solomon, don't marry 600 wives. Can I get an amen and a hallelujah? All right? That's no good for either party. All right? All right? We learn a lot of things to do and a lot of things not to do from these kings. Uh, you have the kings of the northern kingdom and you have the kings of the southern kingdom. All the kings of the northern kingdom were bad. I mean, they were jacked up, messed up, made so many mistakes, and God would bring judgment. Uh, they'd be assassinated, and someone else would be put in place. But on the southern kingdom, which were two tribes of Judah, Benjamin and Judah, I mean, they'd have some good kings come in from time to time, and they would do some things that we could really learn from. And that's what we're going to look at today. And these kings were under so much pressure. I mean, so much pressure, and they were always at war, and there's always enemies, or somebody always wanted to take them out, and oftentimes it was a family member <laughs> wanting to take them out. There has never been peace in the Middle East, and there won't be peace in the Middle East until Jesus comes back. It, God said in the, in the book of Genesis to Esau, he said, you're, you're going to fight against your brother all, all the days and generations of this world. And then where is Esau and Jacob, but Esau are um, the uh, Arab people and ethnicity. And, and what do we see? It keeps going. But, hey, forget the Middle East. We don't have peace in middle America. You know, you can talk about what's going on over there. But, man, when you've got issues in your own backyard, you've got to be careful about pointing those fingers. And when the pressure's on, our character comes out. When the pressure's on... Our character comes out. I was at a soccer game last night, and uh, Corbin and uh, Madison Southern. And, uh, oh, man, it was heated. It was a competitive game. And a fight broke out between two players. They got in a scuffle. One suplexed the other guy. Benches cleared. Parents are up. You know, I, I'm kind of, I stand in between the Corbin, Madison, Southern. I don't know what I was going to do. You know, if I, what was I going to pray? Lord God, you know, divide the crowd. I don't know what I was going to do, but I act like I was going to do something. When the pressure's on, right, and you're losing a game or something doesn't go your way, all of a sudden, the, when the pressure's on, our true character comes out. And we see that time and time again. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, the good man brings good things out of the good treasure of his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil treasure of his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. What's inside eventually comes out. And so what we want to talk about today is we want to talk about growing who we are. We want to be the one. Last week, we talked about knowing the one, because we're in this relationship series. Man, in order for your relationships to be all that they can be, that future spouse or the spouse that you have now, maybe you're looking for uh, somebody, you're still dating, or maybe you've been married, or your relationships with your kids or your grandkids... They cannot be all that they need to be or you want them to be unless you know God. It all begins with relationship with him. That's what we talked about last week. We've got to know the one that can help us work out all these differences and difficulties. And uh, there, There's relational wreckage. When, when you take one sinful person and you put them together with another sinful person, you get a mess, and we need Jesus in our mess. We need the Messiah to come into our mess and to help us navigate these relational carnage that so often and so freely happens. So it begins by knowing the one that was last week. Today, we need to be the one. Look to the person next to you and say, I'm going to be the one. Go ahead. You can talk in church. You guys know that? You can talk in church. Hey, I'm going to be the one. Say, I'm going to focus on being the one. If you want to attract the right friends, you've got to be the right friend. You want to attract the right mate, the right spouse, you've got to be the right spouse. And you want to be the right person at work, and you want to be promoted, then you've got to be the, the right person in your character with how, how you carry yourself at work and how, how you work. Your relationships are greatly determined, not by the people around you, but what is within you. And so we want to focus today on being the one. We're going to work on self. Go ahead and... We're going to begin in just a second in 2 Kings 14, 1. But number one in your outline, write this down. Family matters, y'all. Family matters. Who you belong to and how you're raised, it matters. 
Now, for those of you that might not have done this yet, you can download our app. Uh, we are IBC. It's a free app, and our out is on there every week. And you can fill in the blanks. You can send it to people. It's great. So, number one, write that down. Family matters. Amaziah, he was the son of Joash, and he became king. Picking up in verse 2, the Bible says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Doadin. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father David had done. Anytime it talks about David, now David wasn't his father. David was like his great-great-grandfather. But in the scriptures, David was the litmus test. He was the plumb bob. He, he was the standard by which everybody was judged. Maybe you have a sibling like that, you know, or a cousin. And they're like, oh, why can't you be like Johnny? Or why can't you be like Sally? It was always, why can't he be like David? David did this. He said he, he did what was good, but he, he wasn't quite as good as David. In everything, he followed the example of his father, Joash. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. After the kingdom was firmly in his grasp, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. Yet he did not put the children of the assassins to death in accordance with what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded, Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin." The kings constantly compare to David, to their fathers, if you're in Chronicles or if you're in the book of Kings. This is who his mommy was. This is who his daddy was. He didn't do like his daddy did or he did like his daddy did. And he, his mom influenced him to righteousness or his mom influenced him for wickedness. Your family matters. Who's impacting? Who's your tribe? Who are those people around you that have that kind of influence? The 2020 census came out, and in the United States, 44% of all boys and girls in the U.S. live in a home without a parent or a dad. 44%. They don't have a mom in the home, and they don't have a dad in the home. That's a problem. God designed the family. It's the first institution before government, before the church. God designed the family because family matters. And 44%, in our area, it's higher than that. I don't know the exact statistic. I just know it's higher. I don't have a source for that. 44%. That's incredible. Fatherlessness in America is wrecking our culture. Eddie Phillips, he's a police officer in Louisville, African-American, strong Christian, very impressive young man. He said at a recent event in Louisville, the greatest problem in our community is not uh, crime. The greatest problem in our community is not race. The greatest problem in our community and in Louisville is fatherlessness. He added, absentee fathers are now enabled by government programs that actually encourage and underwrite the source of the problem. Family matters. A high school coach in Port Charlotte, Florida, said that two-thirds of the young men on his football team they don't have a father figure in their life. And not, not that they just don't have a father. They don't have a father figure in their life. Somebody to look to, to say, okay, how am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to act? In, in troublesome situations, how am I supposed to respond? Many of you, perhaps even like me, can relate to those situations. And while family matters, know this, it doesn't define you. It doesn't have to define you. Our heavenly father desires to adopt us and he becomes our father. He becomes the one that we look to. He's the one that guides us. He's the one we go to for wisdom. He's the one we go to for counsel. Pastor Brett and Lindsay Martin, Brett primarily serves at our Corbin campus and he does a little bit of everything. And uh, they're adopting. Uh, they're adopting. They have three great kids and they're about to have a fourth. They're adopting from India. In fact, I think we have a picture of William. Uh, this is his passport picture. So in the next few weeks, uh, they're going to go to a, a small village in India of 2 million people. Okay, 2 million people. That's about half the population of the state of Kentucky. And, uh, and, and they're going to go and they're going to pick up William. And they're going to bring him back. 
William, who didn't know a mom, didn't have a dad, just dropped off an orphanage as a baby. But one day, in the very near future, within the next month, Brett and Lindsay Martin are going to walk in to an orphanage. And they're going to look at William. And they're going to go, he is mine. He is no longer an orphan, but he is a son. He is no longer uh, somebody's no name out there. No, he is William Martin. And he is going to be brought into the family with all the rights as a son. He's going to be brought in with all the rights of an heir to Brett and Lindsay Martin. Brothers and sisters, friends and family. When you're adopted into the family of God, you have all the rights as a son. You now have all the rights as a daughter to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The creator of the heavens and the earth now brings you into his family. And you're adopted into his family. You know, I, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> Arcade apartments, close to Churchill Downs. I didn't, my dad was around a whole lot. Most of my young life as a child, my dad was in prison. My mom was a bartender, worked late hours, just didn't see her a whole lot. I'm thankful for both my mom and my dad. But I'm also thankful that God put other men and women in my life that influenced me. I think of Mr. Weiser, who was a middle school counselor at Southern Middle School in Louisville, Kentucky. And he pulled me and Pat aside uh, at the end of our seventh grade year. And he said, hey, boys, I've got an opportunity for you. How would you like to work? How would you like a job this summer? You're going to make some money. I said, oh, I'd love to do that. I thought he picked the best two kids in the class. I said, Who, you, wouldn't, you would only send the best two kids to do this job. Later I learned he was just trying to keep us out of trouble. You know, he's like, I better keep these two boys busy or something's going to happen. And he went he introduced us to Royce Cruz. Royce Cruz was a retired counselor and teacher from Stewart Middle School. And every summer, Royce Cruz, he had a landscaping business. And he would, he would take us all around Louisville, and he had these different jobs. And we learned how to saw wood and, 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 and pick up brush and cut wood and haul it off. And we worked hard, and he paid us. But that summer, Royce Cruz was a dad to me. He told me what it looked like to work hard, to show up on time, and, 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 and to carry out and to finish what you start. You've had people like that in your life. God is so gracious to us. Our Father is a good, good Father. He will not leave you alone. He will not leave you to yourself. But He's going to bring people in. He's brought here at this campus, I, I, I think of uh, Wes Metcalf and John and Mike and so many others that fill, I think, uh, Mr. West right here, that fill this room. And that God has called us together as a family. There is no metaphor that is more frequently used in the Bible to describe our relationship with one another and with God than family. Look to the person next to you and say, you're family. You're family. You're family. Yeah, some of you just look to them and say, man, I hope we're really family. You just, you just got a proposal just then. <laughs> God loves us that much. He will bring us in. Listen to what 2 Kings 12, 2 says. And Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days he was instructed by Jehodiah the priest. Joash didn't have a mom or a daddy. They were killed. But this priest brought him in. When he was old enough, he brought him before the people and he became king. And then Joash was then the son of a Messiah that we just talked about. God will use different people in life. Number two, write this down. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. The people around you will greatly determine your destiny. Sociologists tell us that you're the sum total of your seven closest friends. You bring to me a list of your seven closest friends and, and you tell me a little bit of demographics about them, what they do for a living, what their family life looks for them, how healthy are their relationships, then I can greatly determine how healthy your relationships are, what you do, and how you carry yourself. And we see that in God's Word. It is important to have the right people around you because bad company will corrupt good character. You're doing good. You're flying high. You get hooked up wrong person and they begin to lead you astray. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Kings 12 beginning in verse 6. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me with these people, he asked. The people would come to him and said, hey listen, Solomon, man, he worked us hard. Solomon worked us so hard, that's how we got this temple built. But we're kind of tired. We want to go to the house for a while. 
And then he comes to his dad's advisors, kind of the elders of the town. And he says, how should I respond to them? We pick up here in verse 7. And they replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men he had grown up with and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father has put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, but I will make it even heavier. My father scored you with whips. I will score you with scorpions. They had not read how to win friends and influence people. Okay, I mean, you know, can you imagine? He's standing before this great throng of people. And they are wore out, and they're asking for some relief. And he says, my pinky is, you know, greater than my father's waist. It's thicker, and, and he scored you with whips. I'm going to score you with scorpions. They go to the house, y'all. They're done. They leaving. His, his, the kingdom is divided at this point. Why? Because he listened to the wrong people. Who are you listening to? Who are the folks that have influence in your life? I'm not talking social influencer, you know. I hope it ain't a YouTuber that's telling you what's right and wrong and how to live your life. Great things on YouTube, though. I fixed my refrigerator. I did. I fixed it. My wife was doubting me, but I fixed it. YouTube video. But your theology, your belief, your ethos about life, where you're going to conduct yourself. Who is it that's having influence in your life? In order to be the one, you've got to have the right people around you the right friends, the right tribe. Show me your friends, and I'll show you my future. Farmington Heart Study did an interesting study, incredibly thorough, where they were investigating this concept. And they found that 61% of people who had a friend that smoked, they actually smoked too. So if your friends smoke, you're going to be 61% likely to smoke also. And if your friends of a friend that smokes, you're 29% likely to smoke. And I found this interesting. There's all kinds of information on there. But they studied happiness. And the, the researchers found that happy friends make you happier. That you're more likely to be happy if your friends are happy. In other words, if you have a bunch of Eeyores in your life, you know Eeyore, you know the donkey on Winnie the Pooh, Poo, always me, you know, things are all, my life is horrible, you know, my class is sting, all that. If you have a bunch of Eeyores around you, you're going to be an Eeyore. You're going to be down, you're going to be discouraged. And, but what the Bible teaches here is who is around you and influence you matters. And they will influence you just like you're influencing them. And you want people around you that love Jesus. You want people that are pursuing the things of God that uplift you, not tear you down. My youth pastor, Rick Bowden, when I was in high school, he told me, he said, Alan, you always want to find a wife who's a better Christian than you. And I took that advice with me. And by the grace of God, I found that. But later I thought about that. I was like, man, if somebody would have given her that advice, she never would have married me. You know, it's like, so maybe that just applies to the guys. But you're always looking for somebody who's further along in the faith than you. you if you're an athlete, you want to play with somebody that's just a little bit better than you, and that gets you better, right? If, 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 you're, a, if you're a musician, you want somebody that's just a little bit further along than you, can show you a few things. So in the Christian walk, you want somebody just a little bit further than you. Somebody that's pursuing the things of God. And because that is going to have a direct impact on your relationship with God. And that's exactly what we see here in, in the life uh, here. Robin and I, a number of years ago, we were growing a garden. And again, I, I'm not a gardener. When we needed vegetables, we went to the pick pack. You know, we went to Win dixie growing up in Louisville. But we decided we were going to grow a garden. They were, like, renting, like, space. So we started growing a garden and didn't know anything that I was doing. It was not a very good experience. Uh, but one thing we did, we wanted some peppers. Because so I like to make sauce and that kind of stuff. So we make some peppers. And I put all these pepper plants out. And for some reason, I decided to put one hot pepper plant out. Just for fun. I mostly tease people. I say, oh, man, I'm going to give this away to my next door neighbor. You know, and, uh, like, I dare you to eat this. Almost kind of a, a funny thing to do. And, uh, but I planted it along with the other pepper plants. And what this guy didn't know 
is pepper plants cross-pollinate like crazy. And every one of our pepper plants, all the peppers were hot. Even the, the, the bell pepper, you know, bell, it did not have a bell shape. It had a jalapeno shape. Even our bell, everything was hot, and it ruined everything. People are just like that. We cross-pollinate. And whoever's next to you, they're going to influence you. And you're going to be shaped by them. You're going to be shaped by their actions, what they believe, what they're for, and what they're against. So we need to make wise decisions. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. That's why here at Emmanuel, life groups are so important. We want to help connect you to some 2 a.m. friends. We, we want to help connect you to a tribe that will love Jesus and help you love and pursue Jesus. In fact, we're going to have life group launch here in just the next few weeks. And uh, all of your campus pastors at each location, uh, they'll be giving you some information even today. Just this past week, my wife Robin and I uh, were in a life group on Wednesday nights in Corbin. And, uh, man, I love our life group. And we get together and we just support one another. And so when things go down at 2 a.m., who are you going to call? Right? Not Ghostbusters. No. You're going to call your life group. Those people that believe in you, that, that know all your mess, and they still like you. And you're doing life together, and you're working through things together. And so two weeks ago, a guy in our life group says, listen, I want you to, I want you to pray uh, for my brother. Um, he's not a believer. He's uh, probably atheist. Uh, very uh, much opposition to everything that God's doing in my life now. And this was like the end of life group. It was like just kind of a tag on at the end. Like, yeah, well, let's pray for that. So we gathered around and we prayed for our brother. We prayed for his brother. And then this past week, we're in life group. We're going through the Proverbs. We're kind of saying in the Old Testament since all our sermons this year in the Old Testament. And, and we have life group and we're done. And we're walking out. He's walking out. And he kind of comes back in the room. And he's like, hold on, by the way, my brother called me this week. And we had a great discussion. And like, now you're telling us, you know, it's like, you should have let off with that. You know, I mean, that's like, you know, like attacked on at the end. But we just celebrated together as a life group. Those small steps of victory of what God is doing. And so we gather together in life groups. Pastor John and, and Mike and your leadership team here, they, they can't minister to all of you. But you know, the good news is we're all ministers of the gospel. And God's not brought you here by accident. You're here for a reason. And God's brought you here to link you together. Because if you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Number three, and finally, we need to tear down some high places. We learn that from the kings. We learn so much from them. Beginning in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 2, the Bible says, Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. And again, David wasn't his father, but he was a descendant of David. David is the standard. He removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones. He cut down the Asherah poles. He broke it into pieces. The bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. He took down the high places. What are high places? The high places in their day were places that they would go and worship false gods. They would wonder if Yahweh was really listening, if Yahweh was going to do what they wanted them to do, because they wanted their God to be like a puppet on a string. And whatever string they pulled, that's what their God did. And so many of them, they would go up to these literally high places, and they would construct these altars of stone and wood, and they would sacrifice animals on these sacrifices. Some places they actually sacrificed children on these places. That's why God in the Old Testament, sometimes he will wipe out an entire people because they would actually sacrifice these children. And so that they would go up. And I remember walking through the mountains of Guatemala and we'd dr driven into Nabal about a bus ride on a chicken bus out of the capital city, Guatemala City. And then we hiked through the mountains. And I remember our guide, the missionaries, we walked through the mountains. We'd get to one of these high places. And he would point over to the stone structure and he says, that's a high place. Shamans come out here every night. And if, and if you'll pay them, they'll come and, and, and they will own those high places. They will sacrifice a chicken for you if your 
child is sick or your, your livestock is having trouble. Empty promises. Just a gimmick, a moneymaker that we see today. Well, they've always been these high places. But you and I, we don't, we don't do that. It doesn't look like that for us. So what are our high places? High places in our lives are those things that we're not swept clean. The, those places in our lives where sin still reigns. Hezekiah, when he became king, he cleaned house. You know, when you're about to sell your house, man, there's a lot of houses selling these, buying and selling homes. When you go to sell a home, you clean every nook and cranny of that home. You clean places that have never been touched in months. You get up on window sills and baseboards. Why? Because you want to get the greatest dollar. You want people to see and go, man, this place is clean. I want to buy it. Hezekiah came into the temple and he cleaned places that had never been cleaned. He went up to the high places and he said he, he, not, only, he not only took them down, he destroyed them. He said, annihilated them. Wanted to take it completely out of the lives of the Israelites. So that temptation wouldn't be there any longer. What are the high places in your life? Those places that you're a follower of Christ, but nobody even knows that's your struggle. They don't know that's your addiction. It might be an addiction to pornography. It might be some chemical addiction. It might be some secret sin, of some insecurities that you have, and you're a people pleaser, and you desire to please people more than you desire to please God. In those deep recesses of your heart, those are the high places. Those high places that must come down for you to be the person that you want to be, to, to, to be the person that God wants you to be, so you attract the friends that you need, to attract the relationships that you need to drive, you've got to take down those high places because they're impacting you. It is hidden sin, and the only person that knows about it is God, but it impacts your attitude. It impacts your perspective of other people, how you treat them, and whether you treat a sister in Christ as just that, or you treat them as an opportunity. Whether you think of somebody at work as somebody just to crawl over so you get the next promotion, or you think of them as someone who is dearly loved by the Father. Those high places in our heart, just like Hezekiah, we've got to tear them down whenever that secret sin is in our life. But you know one thing that um, I'm really grateful for as I read these stories, these jacked up kings, you know, I thought, I look at them, I was like, man, I'm not that bad. I thought, you know, I look at these kings and their lives and their families. What I'm reminded is that God doesn't use perfect people. God uses us, even our mess, because God still used these kings. He still used them and their families for his glory and honor. And even Jesus came down through this lineage of all these Kings that had worshipped foreign gods and uh, were polygamists and uh, just not godly. But, but God would still use them in moments in their life when they were devoted to him. God wants to use you. It doesn't matter what your past did. God cares more about your future than he does your past. You're looking for a good place to say amen. That was it, right? You know, God, God cares more about your future than he does your past. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for that. Because there are things in my past, I'm, I'm glad that's where they're at in my past. One of our values here at Emmanuel is that God's grace is greater than my past. Grace is greater than your past. That his grace is sufficient for us, for his power is made perfect in our weakness. And if, if I've come to tell you one thing today from the Lord, it's this. God wants to use you. God wants to use you to change this world. Maybe you're a freshman here at EKU. You're a freshman at Cumberland or Union or Somerset, University of Kentucky, wherever you're watching from today. Jakarta, Malaysia, wherever, wherever you might be tuning in with us today. God wants to use you. And God moves us and he is shaping us and he wants to do it to bring glory to his name. That God uses the humble, those that are willing to say, listen, I've got issues, but God still wants to use you. And he wants to use you today, not next week, not when you get everything straightened up. Because guess what? We won't get everything straightened up until Jesus comes back. There won't be complete peace in the Middle East, Middle America, or in the middle of my life until Jesus comes back. But we need to know that today God can bring a peace that is real and is true. 
And if we will submit and surrender to him in all these things, he will use you to do something incredible. He will use you to bring other people to his name. He will use you to disciple others. And if you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ, just like Wes said here in our campus earlier during our worship time, that you can come to faith today, to trust him today. And God takes our unrighteousness and he replaces it with the righteousness of Christ. That if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But the ball's in your court. The ball's in your court. He's done everything that's needed for life and godliness, the Bible says. So the ball's in your court. Are you going to trust him totally today? What does that look like? The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is God and God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's where it begins. You need to know the one. In order to be the one, you need the God that created you to have a real, personal, intimate relationship with him. In just a second, I'm going to pray, and the worship team's going to come up at all of our locations, and we're going to invite you today to come forward and give your life to Christ. You know, some of you just need to come forward at the front of the stage and, and, and say, God, I need you. God, forgive me my sin. God, use me. Maybe today you're burdened over a coworker. You're burdened over a relationship. There's just something special about getting up from your seat and coming forward, saying, I don't care what people around me think. I only care what God thinks. And I'm going to respond by faith to God today. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. But if before man you will proclaim me, then before the Father I will do the same. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as I pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for your mercy that is sufficient and your grace, uh, God, that consumes our lives when we call out to you. That your grace is sufficient for your powers made perfect in our weakness. And so, Jesus, I pray right now that you would move. I pray that those that don't know you, God, would come to know you today and that they would come forward and respond to you. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.